So our guest today is Bill Nordstrom. Bill has had a very successful career within the chemical industry. Chemistry being one of the basic sciences, it gets applied in today's world by chemical engineers to a large extent, uh, which is Bill's area of expertise. Since retiring, Bill has become a well-loved instructor in chemistry and engineering courses here at GCC. So the first thing, Bill, <laughs> um, let's take you back to high school. Wh where we, where'd you go to high school? I grew up in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Just outside of Boston, a little well, to the west? Well, so mid, mid-state. You know, it's about uh, 45 miles east of here and yeah. uh, about an equal distance from Boston west. Um, sort of in the central part of the state. And it was a uh, sort of an, an industrial, small industrial city. Uh, at the point in time that I was growing up, we had a, a small steel mill there, yeah. American Steel and Wire. Yeah. We had other s manufacturing companies like Crompton and Knowles. They did a lot of machine parts and things like that. So it was a, it was, it was a fairly active in, uh, manufacturing center at the time. And uh, well, Norton Company was there with the, uh, their abrasives and uh, grinding wheels and things. So, but a lot of that has since uh, left the area like a lot of other things. Yeah, gone but overseas. Or yeah, I went, I went to uh, regular public high school in the, the main south section of Worcester, it was South High School. And uh, going to high school I had no idea what I wanted to do. Absolutely none. And that was primarily uh, a function of, I think life in general at the time and uh, where I was coming from. I, I was coming from a very uh, working class family. My father was a uh, had been trained as a tinsmith and was basically uh -huh. working as a laborer in a steel mill. Yeah. Um, my mother had uh, only a secondary school education. And uh, their goals for me, I was the f first in fact, I had one sibling who has since died, but uh, I was the first and only to, to go to college. And their, my parents' mission for me, their, their goal for me was to have a good, steady job. Career wasn't something that was thought of particularly at the time. And I remember even the, uh, the guidance counselors at, in the high school were not particularly oriented towards, you know, planning a career so much as, as whatever. As, as getting a job. As, as getting a as job. Earning an income and yeah, being able exactly. to support a having family. A, having a steady job, yeah. which was, you know, post-World War II, that, you know, it, this was in the early 60s, and I mean, you know, World War II was passed, the Korean War was uh, over, Vietnam was starting, and uh, so there's a lot of unrest from that type of thing. but. Uh, you know, it wasn't, wasn't so much a matter of career planning. However, I had a couple of uh, high school teachers. Uh, the guidance counselor I had was not a, a significant influence in my, my progression out of high school, but I had two high school instructors that were very much so. One was, uh, I remember their name as well too, Mrs. Nugent, who was my chemistry teacher, and uh, Ralph Mayo, who was my mechanical drawing instructor. Uh -huh. And both of them felt like I had an aptitude for for engineering of some ilk, mm -hmm. and suggested that I try to pursue that type of thing as a as a career. I had no idea what I'd be getting into, but with their guidance, I applied to uh, three schools and got accepted to all three. I what were the schools then? Worcester Polytech in Worcester, yeah. uh, Northeastern down towards Boston, yeah. and Cornell. Huh. And miraculously, I got accepted to all three. I opted for Worcester Polytech for a number of reasons. One, it was the least expensive of the three at yeah. the time, and it was also close to home, so I didn't have to ha worry about the expense of uh, living in a dorm and on campus, which, in hindsight, I wish had been the case. How, however, since I was paying my own college through a few small scholarships and college loans, uh, just really wasn't in the cards for me. So I, I lived at home and, and, and went to WPI. Ah. And, uh, it's funny, I, I had this, the same exact experience. I lived at home and went to Northeastern because I was living in Boston. Yeah. And went to Northeastern because it was co-op. You could pay your way through with work. Yeah, so. yeah. I, did, I did, did some, did some co-op work. I had some scholarships and I, the rest I did with, with college loans. And when I got out of college, I, shortly after I got out of college, I went in the service. So I, I, I spent my hard-earned money from, from the service in uh, paying for my college education. Huh. But anyway, when I went to... Uh, college as a yeah. freshman, I had no idea what I wanted to do. For some reason, I went with the vague thought in the back of my mind that I might pursue electrical engineering. And that was really a function of uh, 
my drawing instructor. He thought that that would be a, a good fit for me. And I don't know whether that was the fact that I was meticulous about my drawings or whatever, but he seemed to think that that would be a, a good fit for me. And uh, so I went with that thought. And uh, I rem remember sitting at uh, freshman orientation and being totally intimidated when the individual who was orienting the freshman class <laughs> said, look to your right and yeah. look to your left, <laughs> because one of the three of you is not going to be here at the end of the semester, and one of the other two of you is not going to be here at the end of the year. And uh, so I didn't know what I was getting into. But anyway, the, 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 the amazing thing that happened in freshman year was I just wound up with a chemistry professor who was just phenomenal. He was uh, a combination of everything he'd ever wanted an instructor, somebody who really cared, somebody who absolutely understood every nuance of his subject. Uh, he was a showman. He knew how to make it exciting and interesting. And he, he, he did some strange things. We, we attended <laughs> lectures in a lecture hall. And I remember one of the things he, he, he really, really, really did not like was somebody falling asleep in a lecture of his. <laughs> so he had a starter's pistol. <laughs> oh, geez. And he would come up behind the individual that was sleeping and fire the starter's pistol. <laughs> and sometimes those people leapt several rows down <laughs> in the auditorium. But anyway, he was just he was just he was just a real character and that, that got me interested in chemistry as a, as a subject and uh, I started to pursue that thought, uh, you know, as yeah. I started to, with my college career. And uh, I, I followed that through. Uh, we did not have to declare a major until our junior year. And I already knew that I was gonna pursue chemistry. So I took mostly as many chemistry courses as I could in my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And then in my junior year, I started to focus on the engineering because uh, when I reached the junior year, uh, I not only had to decide whether I was going to pursue chemistry or whatever, but I had to decide whether I was going to go into being a theoretical chemist or whether I was going to be a more, a, applied. A, more like, applied in terms like, of engineering. Yeah. And uh, I knew if I was going to do anything, I didn't want to sit at a lab bench all my life. Boring. So, <laughs> well, well, boring. I mean, there yeah. are, if, if, if you're interested in what goes on in a, in a Petri dish or a beaker or under a microscope, it's the ideal place to be. Right. But I was more interested in uh, how chemistry went through bigger equipment and machines and uh, how, that, how the machine affected the chemistry and how the chemistry affected the machine. And uh, that led me into chemical engineering. And I really wanted to pursue that on a on a bigger scale in the, the microscale chemistry. So I went into chemical engineering. And uh, that's what I did for uh, 28 years, basically. And I had a grand time doing it. I had a lot of fun. So you, you liked it? I liked it a lot. The little uh, hiatus from that was uh, three years on active duty in the Navy. Did and they use any of your chemical engineering background, or they, were you chipping paint? Or <laughs> no, I was, ac I was actually an officer in the Navy, and uh, the, the beauty of it was that uh, along with everything else, I mean, if you're, if you're into chemistry, one of the things I discovered when I was in high school, I was totally into explosives. So I did a lot of playing with explosives. So <laughs> I, I, when I got commissioned in the Navy, my first billet was being gunner or officer on the destroyer. Uh -huh. And playing with five-inch cannons and uh, submachine guns and grenade launchers was... It was just a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Jeez. I got to fire the, the big guns. I got my. So, how did you get to be an officer in the Navy? It was interesting. Uh, Were you in Naval ROTC or something at no, WPI? No, or? it's a it, no, it's a. Th this is really a, a strange twist of things. When I was in high school, when the Vietnam War started, my father had been a, a ground pounder, foxhole dodger in uh, World War II. He said, you know, if you're going to get involved in a war, and you obviously are going to get involved in some way, uh, you should join the Navy. At least you'll have a, a clean bed and three square meals until you get killed, you know, <laughs> which is not the case if you're, you're in the infantry. In the infantry. Right. You know, eating sea rations and getting muddy is not the, the ideal way to go. So I joined the Naval Reserve, and then uh, that was when I was a junior in high school. And then when I went to WPI, WPI had mandatory Army ROTC. Uh huh. So uh, I tried to not deal with the Army ROTC by virtue of the fact that I was already in, in, uh, enlisted in the, in the Naval Reserve, but the, the ROTC people would not hear anything about that <laughs> because, well, and their reasoning was, was, was sound reasoning, actually. You know, I was enlisted in the Naval Reserve, and I was in an ROTC program that would have provided me with a second lieutenant's bars when I graduated. Oh, yeah, so that's how you so get you. 
you were up? Well, well, yeah, but what I did was I didn't want to get, I didn't want to pursue the Army one, so I started casting around for what else I could do because I really wanted to stay with the Navy. Yeah. Uh, my paternal, my maternal grandfather had been in the Navy for a long time, and uh, I wanted to uh, be, I, I, I opted for the Navy as a, as, a, as a service that I wanted to be in, and uh, so I looked at the possibility of what else I could do, and I found Officer Candidate School, and I needed uh, support from my congressman, and I got that support. And uh, I got an appointment to Officer Candidate School when I graduated from, so uh -huh. I, was that, I had that appointment in hand when I was graduating from college, so I didn't have to accept the second lieutenant's bars. I could go to Army uh, oh, yeah. Navy OCS, yeah. and I wound up, wound up coming out of there as an ensign in the Navy. So how many years were you in the Navy then? I was on active duty for three years and uh, with, reserve, uh, with reserve time a total of 11 years. Uh, yeah, okay. And then you had, you're out. Now yeah. what do you do? I was out and now what do you do? It's uh, <laughs> not casting around for work. And I found a number of, number of interesting little jobs. You know, it was a point in time when, when I got out of the service, it was uh, 1971. And it wasn't the greatest time uh, in terms of employment in the country. And I wound up taking a job in uh, Boston, uh, right outside of Boston, actually, in Quincy, at uh, uh, U.S. Gypsum. Oh, yeah. And I took a job as the uh, quality control supervisor for... For drywall <coughs> manufacturing? Making drywall. Yeah. And that lasted for a while, but it... Uh, so how do they make drywall? How do they make drywall? Yeah. Oh, geez. They, they get uh, this uh, or, uh, volcanic rock and they ship it in by the shipload and they put it in big silos. Yeah. Uh, they grind it in a hammer mill, pound it down, then they grind it some so more. Like powder consistency? Yeah, get it down to a powder consistency. And depending upon the grade of plaster that you're going to make, it gets uh, finer and finer. Uh, in fact, there's uh, what they call, uh, at the time, U.S. Gypsum had a plaster called XL plaster, which was uh, a 99 plus grind in terms of going through a 100 micron sieve. And uh, it was very, very fine. And once you've got it ground, you have to, what they call calcining, which is basically to dry all the water out of it because yeah. it's a hydrate. Yeah. And uh, when they do that, then it, it forms a, a powder that actually will accept a lot of water. And for the, the XL plastic, which goes on walls, they would actually mix it with water, quench it, dry it, and regrind it and do it a second time. Uh, but the stuff that went into uh, the stucco that went into wallboard was only went through the the calciner once, and then it went into uh, board production where it was mixed with water and whatever else. So if it was going to be uh, wallboard for say a bathroom or something, they need a little uh, water resistance to it. They would add a little asphalt to it. Uh, asphalt, it was, really? Ta? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Add a little liquid asphalt to it. Huh. Uh, if it was going to be uh, for uh, a place where fire was an issue in a lot of places, that, you know, public buildings, if you call fire code, they actually mixed uh, fiberglass into it. Oh. Uh, they had another one that was an insulated board that they actually uh, mixed into the plaster uh, expanded glass beads, huh. which made it a little bit lighter. Oh, yeah. uh, and the stucco was uh, prepared very liquid, and they have a very long conveyor belt that's about uh, 400 feet long. And the, f the bottom, the face sheet of paper is laid it's out. laid on the bottom. Laid right. on the bottom. <laughs> and then there's uh, side guides that lift the edge just a little bit. And then the make stucco. Make it like a puddle? Yeah. Well, you know, it's <laughs> just, just enough so it's a flat sheet with a little raised yeah, edge. Yeah, right. And then you just flow the, the stucco onto it. And then smooth it out then some. It's, then smooth it out. And as it goes, it doesn't take very long to start to set. So a little ways further down the, the belt, they apply the top sheet. Oh, uh, yeah. And then they fold over the edges. Yeah. I and by the time it gets to the end of the, the board, it's, it's set up enough to be cut and, and moved. But it's wet. And then, yeah. it, then it has to go to a kiln to be dried. Yeah. And uh, when I was working for U.S. Gypsum, was at the point in time that they were building the Hancock Tower in uh, Boston. Right, where my high school used, used to, to be. be. <laughs> right, <laughs> Boston yeah. Tech. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing I remembered about that more than anything was that uh, we were providing not only the wallboard but the plaster for it. And we actually had to come up with a special m mix of plaster that could be pumped up 50-something stories. And when it arrived up at the top, being of a consistency that it could be sprayed onto a wall and troweled. Oh, jeez. So it was kind of that was kind of an interesting feat. But I was the uh, I wasn't the engineering that system. I was just the quality control supervisor. And the issue I had with uh, that was that uh, the quality control was not the rules were there, but the standards weren't adhered to. Uh -huh. 
and uh, I got very frustrated when board that I had rejected as being under specification had the tags taken off and shipped anyway. And uh, anyway, uh, that and the plant manager put us put that put me at odds with the plant manager, and I was the loser on that one because he managed to ship his stuff, and I managed to go looking for another job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how long were you at U.S. Gypsum? Uh, two years. Two years there. Yeah, two okay. years there. Uh, then I went to work for a small company in, in Westboro, Massachusetts that uh, mass oxygen equipment, they handled a lot of uh, liquid gases. And I was hired because the company had just bought uh, a process from Chemitron, which was up in upstate New York. And the process was for making cyclopropane, which was uh, a flammable but nevertheless very, very effective anesthesia. Uh -huh. Very old school anesthesia. Uh -huh. And it was very antiquated process to make it, but even though the United States had moved on to anesthetics that were non-flammable and much safer to be around, a large part of the world couldn't afford that more sophisticated technology and they still use things like cyclopropane. Huh. So uh, South America and a lot of the other third world countries bought it in, in relatively large quantities. So um, it was a, you know, it was a really a hands-on process with a, with a kettle reactor and a reflux column and then the the gas that came kettle out. Reactor. Let's, uh, let me, okay, a, a kettle ke reactor. Okay, a kettle reactor is looks just like that. It's a big kettle, kettle. It's maybe <laughs> maybe uh, seven feet in diameter and is about three feet deep. It had a mixer inside, uh, and it had ports through which you could uh, and, uh, feed in wet and dry material. So there was a. I don't remember what all the chemicals were at the moment, but uh, there was a, a a wet organic that we f we got in. Uh, 55 gallon drums that went in, and then there was uh, put in 100 pounds of, I do remember this part, dried zinc powder. Huh. And, uh, and then there was some uh, caustic that went in. And once you started the whole thing, the, the uh, zinc acted not only as a catalyst, but it also as a, it instigated the reaction. And uh, you managed to start producing gas at a fairly significant quantity. Wow. And it was a, a stream of mixed gases that came up. And the reflux column above it, the reflux condenser is where the, the gas stream comes up and it, it condenses part way up and then it so comes down. Cold it, water on the walls or no, something? No, it, it's just got air on the outside. Just air. Just air on the outside. But it, as, the, as the system heats up and the gas becomes pure, the gas that uh, you actually want will actually make it up through the, the column and, and go over into the, the, the refining system. The stuff that's heavier, that's l less volatile, um, flows back into the the kettle reactor mm -hmm. and ultimately you can only get so much gas out of that one one batch, batch of material yeah so ultimately the, the reaction stops the gas that comes off that you're taking out for the cyclopropane come, does have some lighter hydrocarbons with it which went through a series of washing steps using uh, chlorine in a in a caustic and that would fl take the the lighter weight ones out by turning them into chlorohydrocarbons yeah. instead of just unsaturated hydrocarbons. And then the gas that I wanted, the cyclopropane, would go into a compressor and get pressed and put into basically 100 pound propane cylinders. Ah. It was a, an interesting process with a lot of chemical waste that was kind of nasty and uh, it was an old school process. But it was interesting because I had a, I, I ran it. Uh, so you were in charge of the operation of producing Yeah, I was, I, was, I was in charge of the operation of of producing and I had one co-worker with me. We went up to New York State, ran the process for six months, uh, day and night so we could build up an inventory of material. Then we took the process apart, put it on trucks, brought it back to, to Westboro uh, and did everything from helping to build the building it went into to reassembling the process and starting it back up again. Wow. And uh, it was a great learning experience but uh, it's not something that I wanted to do forever. It didn't. It paid a great wage being unemployed, but if you wanted to continue a career, it was not the place to be. Mm -hmm. So I wound up leaving there, and then when I left there, so I So how many years were you working there? Uh, that I worked for about three years. About three years. And so yeah. basically, you were taking and producing a chemical, uh, a medical product, right, anesthetic, mm -hmm. yep. um, from solids and liquids mixed mm -hmm. together in a big kettle, and the chemical reaction produced this gas, yep. this gas put people to sleep. Yep. <laughs> yep. And sometimes you had to be careful because of a very old process and sometimes there'd be leaks and it would start to put the operator to sleep. <laughs> so you had to be aware of what that was doing too. Uh, but uh, it, was, right. it, was, it was interesting old school chemistry, you know. And uh, so that was, that was all, all very interesting. So yeah. then on to what? Then I went on to where I wound up working the bulk of my career. Uh, and that was with uh, the Contro company and 
up in Orange, Massachusetts. The what company? Contro, K-O-N-T-R-O, which is a takeoff on control. Oh, yeah. And the individual who started that company had developed a, a, a type of evaporator. It's called a thin film evaporator. And evaporators are pieces of equipment that take something that needs to have the, the liquid volume reduced in. So there's lots of ways you could do that. But this particular machine was horizontal design. It was shaped like a truncated cone. So you had relatively large diameter on one end, a small diameter on the other, and it had a taper going down. And you fed material at the, the large end, and you took the product out. You took the bottoms out at the, at the small end, and you took the, the vapor off at the small end. And it had a rotating rotor inside. And it was four, a four-bladed rotor that the blades came very close to the surface of the, the, the heat transfer surface in the uh, evaporator. And it was a jacketed vessel so that you could put steam or whatever through the outside of it. Yeah. And the rotor would take the feed and push it against the wall, and that would cause the evaporation to take place, you know, allow the evaporation to take place by contact with the so heat transfer. So what are you evaporating? Water out of this thing, or what? What's yeah, every, every, everything. We, we did things like malathion. We did... Uh, uh, malathion, that's a pesticide? Mal malathion is a, is a, is a pesticide. Uh, we did things like uh, polyol, which is the precursor for making uh, polyurethane foam. Oh. It's a, it's kind of a, it looks like a, sort of like a caramel sauce. Yeah. But it, it can be very thin and you have to concentrate it. Uh, and then we do things like uh, butterscotch and chocolate for the can confectionery <laughs> industry. <laughs> so any, anything for which you could reduce the, uh, the liquid volume through boiling yeah. was something you could put through the machine. In fact, one of the, one of the biggest projects we did was we developed a new process for re-refining old crankcase oil. Back in the, the early 80s when uh, oil, there was an oil embargo and oil was short and yeah. it looked like a, a really inv uh, a viable opportunity for making money yeah. was re-refining crankcase oil. So we developed a process whereby we put the old oil through uh, an evaporator and we take off the, the water, yeah. any residual fuel that was in there. Gasoline. Yeah, and then we take off three cuts of oil out of there three different grades of oil, yeah. and we take the tar bottoms off. And so how did you, how did, when you say you take them off? Yeah, well, it th depends upon how you, how you process it. Yeah. So uh, the, the issue that we had to deal with was that the oil has a, a, a normal atmospheric boiling point of about 1,200 centigrade. There really is no good way to come up with a 1,200 centigrade boiling point in a piece of rotating that, equipment. That's hot. <laughs> that's hot. <laughs> so we used thermonol, which is a synthetic heat transfer fluid, which would get us up to about 680 Fahrenheit, which is, I don't know what, in centigrade, but... Um, not quite red hot, but... Not quite red hot, but hot. Red, red hot. And red. then the other way you reduce the boiling point is by lowering the pressure. Mm -hmm. So we were able to lower the pressure internally to the machine using a combination of uh, liquid ring vacuum pumps and yeah. a steam jet ejector to about 50 microns of positive pressure in, okay. the, in the reactor, yeah. in, in the evaporator. And that allowed us to get down to uh, an equivalent atmospheric boiling point. Well, the atmospheric boiling point in normal conditions would be the 1200 centigrade, but we got it down to a, a realistic boiling point of about 670. Yeah. So we could actually take the oil and split it. Yeah. Now, different grades of oil vaporize at different, different temperatures. temperatures. Right. So the one that came out the bottom was always the, the gear oil or, the, or, right. the, uh, or ultimately the tar bottoms. But the, we, we, we could control it. So we could, took off the water and, and fuel first, and then we took off the light fraction, and then we took off another mid-viscosity mid range oil, and then we take off the, the gear oil, and then we take off the tar bottoms. And one of the things we had to come up with was a microbe that would consume the heavy metals. We had to find a way to get rid of the heavy metals that was in the. You yeah. have heavy metals because the rotating equipment per the wears and the chips get yeah. into the fuel and the yeah. oil, and you have to find some way to deal with it because you can't put it back out there again. Right. So we uh, contracted with a company in Louisiana who developed a microbe that would actually pick up the oil, uh, pick up the, the metal. And what was nice about it is once the, the organism... So now you're into biology doing chemistry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. using microbes yeah. to, uh, to... The metal, um, did it exist as pure metal or was yeah, it, it in was compounds? Well, it, it, usually, it usually wasn't in compounds, but it could be on occasion in compounds. But uh -huh. uh, these bacteria would pick up 
whatever that metal was. And the beauty, beautiful part about it was, you know, it, it, it can't it can't consume it. It can't con turn it into anything else. Yeah. But it does contain it, so it separates it from the oil. The bacteria ultimately dies. And when it dies, you can put a flocculin into the, the solution. What's a flocculin? Flocculin is something that'll make something uh, lightweight and, and float. Float? Yeah. Okay. So we put a flocculin in, and that would make the the bacteria come to the surface as a foam that could be skim off. skimmed off. Yeah. And then they could be disposed of in a much smaller quantities in a. Yeah. You know, in a hazardous waste landfill. <laughs> so it was, it was a really interesting process. It we sounds came, like it. We came up with a process that would allow us to uh, re-refine the oil for about, I think it was something like 87 cents a quart. Oh. But of course, about just about the time that, that we got that process all worked out, we started looking at buying uh, land on the Mississippi down in Geismar, Louisiana. Um, Oil became very plentiful again, and price 80 went down. eighty-seven cents a quart to produce oil that was going to sell for a dollar five cents a quart was <laughs> not worth it. <laughs> oh, geez. So uh, that ah. that was the benched, and it, to my knowledge, it has not been resurrected since. But ah. so it was a it was an inter a really interesting interesting process. Now, in addition to the the evaporators uh, that. Uh, we worked with uh, most of our evaporators. We had some that were, if it, it was, if it was just stainless steel and carbon steel, it could be made very easily in this country. If it was all stainless steel or a higher alloy, like Hasteloy C or uh, Alloy 20, all of which have higher, um, Strengths. more exotic metal contents in it, you yeah. know. Okay. A alloy 20 has like 20% uh, nickel in it, you know, so if you have a higher alloy. Um, most of our machines were built by Hitachi in Japan. And Hitachi developed an incredible process for, and if you're b building a machine to withstand massive amounts of material, it has to be relatively thick walled. But if you're going to make it thick walled and use exotic materials, it becomes cost prohibitive in terms right. of being able to do it. Too expensive. Too expensive. So Hitachi was able to develop a process whereby they could explosion clad lower grade materials with high grade alloys. Because they w m those materials, in and of themselves, by virtue of the differences in chemistry, are not weldable. However, if you create a hot enough environment where you can actually make both metals molten, then they'll adhere together. Yeah. And they came up with a method of explosion cladding, whereby they would lay out the, the heavy material, put this explosive material down on the surface of it, and put a very thin layer of the alloy on top of it, and then they would basically detonate the, the, explosive? the, the explosive. And it would blow the... It would liquefy the surfaces and and marry the two pieces. Oh, jeez! Raise yeah. the temperature so quickly. Raise the temperature so quickly that it would actually. What they use for explosive dynamite? Or? I that was a propri proprietary <laughs> information, and they <laughs> would not divulge that. Gotcha. But uh, it was a really interesting process. But it, it it worked really really well and allowed us to be very competitive and in very uh, in a very expensive market for pieces of equipment. Oh. So that was. Uh, that was fun. I, I worked with, I ran the pilot plant the, for studies on, uh, on, on the evaporator for a long time. In addition to the evaporators, we also manufactured through a company that we owned in England, uh, what was called a sealless centrifugal pump. It was a chemical pump, a centrifugal pump, uh, which I don't know how familiar people are with pumps, but they have a, have a rotor that turns, turns and, around. and has veins in it. And liquid comes into the, the suction eye of the pump and then goes out on a on a tangent from the casing. Like a fan for, for liquids. Well, like a fan for liquids, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really what it is, a fan for liquids. And uh, we had become interested in this company because it was Howard Mechanical Development and the Howard brothers had developed a, uh, a way of driving a pump using permanent magnets that allowed you to contain the liquid completely inside a, a containment vessel that was uh, you know, permeable to the magnetic field. Yeah and allowed you to just completely seal it from the environment. Whereas a standard centrifugal pump has a shaft that sticks through and there's a packing gland or something that goes through it. And the packing gland has to leak on the order of 20 drops of material per minute on constantly, because it has to lubricate the seal. You can't run uh, a, yeah, a, dry a, synthetic, a dry seal. You, right. you know, a synthetic material like a rubber or something like that against the shaft, it just gets hot yeah, and it fails. Melts, fails. And when it fails, you get a big leak. So it has to leak in order to lubricate itself. And we were able to eliminate that for ma for materials, for chemicals that were really, really toxic, like yeah. uh, hydrogen cyanide and, and things like that. Poisonous stuff like Poisonous that. Poisonous stuff. You don't want any leakage. Phosgene and uh, other things that you really don't want getting out into the environment. And uh, so it had a huge, huge market for that. And uh, we also did a food pump, 
which was a, a, a very interesting positive displacement pump. The, uh, it also had a, a circular rotor, but it had a sine wave built into it. Mm. And it had a shuttle that went back and forth. And uh, so you had suction on one side, discharge on the other. Mm. And the interesting thing about it was... With a little had, valve in it? That yeah, and the thing was that it was such a gentle piece of equipment in terms of uh, moving food or that it didn't, you know, if you pumped things like pie filling, it didn't tear up the apples. Right. If you pumped, uh, you could pump things like silicone, which you, pure silicone, which you basically had to cut out of a drum. You could actually pump it with this piece of equipment Jeez. effectively. But th we had, we actually did a, uh, a large size machine and we took it to a trade show and unfortunately, they shut us down down there for it. But we actually had a big tank with a big standpipe, and we had goldfish. And the goldfish would go through the pump. Uh, and they were the all goldfish right. goldfish never got harmed, yeah. but they absolutely would not let us do it. We, we, got that, <laughs> we had that running for about three hours, and then they shut us down on that one. So we had to go to tennis balls. I forget where we went. I think we went to ping pong balls. Oh, so, they, you know, they didn't show any dimples, so they were fine. But yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a, a pump that doesn't damage things as right. they go through. Right. They use that for blood these days, don't they? For, oh, yeah. Yeah. for um, artificial yeah, you, hearts. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to crush the cells. Yeah, yeah you don't want to crush the blood cells. Yeah. No. Huh. And uh, at, at one point about five years into my career with them I was given the option of being either the chief engineer on the evaporators or the chief engineer on the pumps. And I opted for the pumps because that was something that we had work every day in. And the evaporator yeah. jobs being capital equipment or Capital equipment being big budget, high cost items that took a long time to build. Yeah. You know, if you did six or seven projects a year, you were doing well. And uh, whereas the pumps were constantly being being done. And sometimes uh, if we were doing a project for like Pfizer Pharmaceutical down in Groton, uh, you might be doing 400 pumps on it. And everything from uh, things handling uh, um, antibacterial agents to uh, feedstocks for for pharmaceuticals to the, the heat transfer fluids that were going to heat the system. Mm. So there was all sorts of things that you handled, and it, you did that constantly. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, when it got to the, after you get past the, the process design of the evaporator, I mean, will it work? If it works, what size can I make it? How fast can I feed it? What do I need for ancillary equipment? Once I get, that, get to that point, I really didn't have that much interest in the ancillary part of, mm. you know, buying the equipment and, right. and, and working at the drawings work, and stuff. Yeah. You know, I'd rather have somebody else draw it. You know, I was perfectly happy making the, deciding whether the machine would work or not. Yeah. But after that, I'd just as soon move on to another project. And the, beauty about, the beautiful part about the pumps was that there was always another project to, to work on and there was always another problem to solve. And that was always, that was always the fun part of it. That was really, um, the, the major piece for me was the, being able to, to solve problems on a constant basis. And I like working with the engineers in the field. I spent a lot of time out uh, at customer facilities teaching them and them teaching me. Mm -hmm. Them teaching me about what the process really was and me teaching them about what my pump could actually could do. Could do, right, for them. Because, because <laughs> yeah. those two seldom came together seamlessly when you, when you looked at a project. The fluid was always clear and clean and the fluid was never clear and clean. There was always some amount of gas being produced or some amount of solids being produced. And solids in a piece of rotating equipment creates erosion. Gas in a piece of equipment, like a pump, vapor locks the impeller. Yeah. If vapor lock the impeller, the machine burns up because there's no fluid going through. Right. So uh, all of those things w w would get involved in it. And uh, so I, the, the, the beautiful part about it was I never knew what I was going to get into. I, I, never, I never walked into a customer's facility feeling confident that I knew what I was going to see. <laughs> I always walked in expecting to find something that I hadn't run into before. <laughs> and often that was the case with some of the simplest solutions ever. <laughs> That's what makes it creative and oh, yeah. fun. I mean, it is. Yeah. I, went into a, I went into a chemical plant in South Texas where they were destroying our pumps one after another. And they proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the, the liquid they were handling was non-volatile, it was clear, it was clean, there was absolutely no reason for it to be destroying our pumps, but it was destroying our pumps. <laughs> and we went around and around and around on it, can't be my pump, it can't be my process, can't be my pump, can't be your process. And finally, we sat down and after, after several days of going around on this and trying to figure out what the problem could be, we sat down with the people who operated the piece of equipment and 
the, the tankage around there. And uh, one of the operators said, well, you know, I think I know what's going on. Tell us. <laughs> and I said, yeah, tell us. I said, well, we feed the, the, the reactor just upstream of that pump from 55 gallon drums. Well, when we take the, bring the 55 gallon drum over with a lift, you know, we take the bung cover off, we set it on top, and then we tip the drum over. And sometimes that bung cover just manages to find its way into the, oh, the tank. Oh, jeez. So when they actually looked in the tank, there were probably 50 of these things. <sighs> and sometimes they would cover the, the, the drain out. Yeah. And sometimes they wouldn't. <laughs> so sometimes the pump would work, and sometimes <laughs> the pump wouldn't. <laughs> Their process was clean. My pump was fine. Yeah. It was all in the handling by the people who were feeding the piece of equipment. So ah, the little covers that you... Yeah, the little, the little cups, cover that screws into covers the... on a 55-gallon tank were getting yep. dropped into the mix. Yep. Just, you know, and, and again, it was, you know, you have to keep an open mind. You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> you never know what you're going to find. So uh. I don't think today you can totally segregate and separate a science from every other science or engineering field. I just don't believe you can do it. Yeah, I don't either. Yet we try and to in we, our we, educational we, systems. We try to in our educational systems, but you know, in reality, uh, you're going to have to have a broad-based education no matter what you're going into. Yeah. And like with, with chemistry in particular, I cannot, I find it difficult to imagine a world where every student coming out of school, out of high, either high school or even back into middle school, doesn't have an appreciation for chemistry and the impact it has on their lives every day of the week. Mm -hmm. There isn't a single thing you do from the time you get up to the time you go to bed that doesn't somehow involve well, chemistry. chemistry. <laughs> you know, from the simplest thing, the toilet paper you need in the morning is bleached paper that involves chemical processing, the toothpaste you use in your mouth, the, the clothes you're wearing, synthetic fibers, the food that you're cooking, you know, and you go on and on and on, the, the cosmetics that the, the women are wearing. Uh, the paint you put on your house, the uh, materials in your car, the stuff you're putting in your garden, uh, the things you clean your house with, you know, everywhere. The pharmaceuticals you take when you feel bad, you know, the alcohol you drink when you're having a party, you know, all of that is handled, it's, it's all chemistry. It Every is. single part of that is chemistry. It is. And there's no way around it. It's basic. It, it is, really basic. is basic. You know, th the years ago, and I th there's, a, there's one textbook publisher, or one author that still does it, uh, Brown and LeMay, is my favorite chemistry textbook. And that particular textbook describes chemistry as the central science. Mm. And I think in a lot of ways it is the central science. Because it's involved with quantum theory that's involved in physics, and it's involved in all of the aspects of the physical world that physics covers. Uh, it's involved in intimately in biology and all of the synthetic world around us. Mm -hmm. Chemistry is there. I don't know if you follow some of the new materials that are out right now that are being researched. Um, there was a new material developed, I think it won the Nobel Prize in either 2010 or 2011. Oh, graphene Graphene, sheets? graphene yeah. sheets. <laughs> uh, the only material that exists in two dimensions. Yeah. 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 A, single, a single atom thick shaped, uh, laid out like a honeycomb in, in a diamond matrix. One gram would produce a sheet that'll cover a football field. Yeah. 200 times stronger than steel, harder than diamonds, 60,000 times thinner than a sheet of saran wrap. Sheesh. Conducts electricity beautifully, conducts, conducts heat beautifully, you know, and you can actually see this layer of material that is only one atom thick. <laughs> God, right. Go figure. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> What well, are we going to end up doing with that, you know? It's oh, going to be yeah. something. Oh, they're doing everything with it. I mean, it's going to be uh, new semiconductors for computers, uh, screens for cell phones and yeah. computers, yeah. Uh, strengthening plastics, yeah. allowing you to put uh, electrical conductivity in plastics without using any, any metals whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or how about the, 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 these days they have self-healing concrete. I haven't heard about that one. Self-healing concrete? Self-healing concrete. Concrete weakens by cracking. Yeah. When it cracks, it gets moisture inside and it, you know, it damages the rebar and yeah. the structure starts to break down. And now what they do is they put in uh, calcium lactate in a bacteria. And the reaction, 
you, if you see a crack and you want to want to repair your thing, if it doesn't, you know, if it's not on a vertical surface or something where you, if it's on a horizontal surface, you don't have to worry about it because the water gets into it. Yeah. When the water gets into it, it activates the, the lactate, and the lactate and the bacteria react and it produces calcium carbonate, which <laughs> fills the crack, and seal, <laughs> reseals the concrete. Ah. And if it's in a vertical surface, you might have to pump water into it, push water into it, but you know. <laughs> so you have the substrate built into it that activates the bacteria, and the bacteria and the, that together forms calcium carbonate, and which is basically the the main element of c concrete anyway. And Tums. And Tums. And it, <laughs> yeah, and it, it fills that crack right up and seals it, so no yeah. more water gets into it. Yeah. And you have relatively large cracks it'll do it with too. Sheesh. So they That's have self they have self healing concrete now. So you know who knows what they're going to develop <laughs> for materials. I think as human knowledge increases. And our, from the standpoint of research, and we see new materials, new materials makes us think about other things. And it's, it's an exponential function. You know, m new materials and ideas come faster than they ever did before. Yeah. And now there's more people thinking about them and coming up with solutions to them and yeah. uses. You know, uses for them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a really, it's, a, it, it's incredible. You know, I was thinking when, when we were thinking about coming here and doing this, I was thinking about my father-in-law who, who died. He would have been 100 this year. And you know, during the eighty-nine, during his eighty-nine years of being alive and being my father-in-law for twenty or so of those years, uh, he went from seeing you know basically the Wright brothers to space flight, right, you know? <laughs> to landing on the moon. <laughs> yeah. And, but then I was thinking too, you know, in my soon to be seventy, and I'm going to be sixty-nine next birthday. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, we had an icebox. The ice man came in a horse-drawn wagon. Yep. And, you know, I've gone from that. We used to have the, the neighborhood. We had deliveries of uh, fresh vegetables in the, in the wagon. We had ba uh, bakery products came in a wagon. Yep. And we had milk was delivered milk to the back porch. And, and bottles. Yeah, milk right. and bottles in the back porch. <laughs> and I remember the, the column of cream standing up on the top of the bottle yep. in, the, in yep. the wintertime when the froze. Yep. Yeah. Uh, to, you know, to what we have now in terms of space flight and everything. You know, when I tell my daughters that the house I was growing up in when I was a kid, you know, I had to be really careful about talking to my girlfriend because we had a party line. You know, oh yeah, exactly. And it, was, it was fixed on the wall. Yeah. There, was, there were three three families on that line. Yep. You know? yep. So when you picked up the phone, you knew you were alone. Right. Right. And you, it wasn't like you're going to take your phone and run into your bedroom and, yeah. and and talk to your girlfriend. You know, you're you're sitting in the corner of the living room. You know. <laughs> and uh, I was just kidding. My daughter, my youngest, yesterday, she's floating around in our pool with uh, on a recliner, basically with her phone. I said, "Doesn't that thing ever leave your hand?" <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you know. I, I, oh, I told her that's got to be an implant at some point in time. Well, either that or people are going to be born with an arm like this, you yeah. know. <laughs> you just insert the phone and it just stays yeah. there, you know. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I think it'll be an implant. <laughs> I suspect it'll be an implant too, but. <laughs> <laughs> evolution doesn't work that way. Evolution doesn't work quite that fast. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But anyway, it's just, you know, it's just mind-boggling where things have gone and how quickly they've gone there. Yeah. Well, for, for our students that are coming through GCC, thinking about the sciences and engineering, it's like, it almost doesn't matter where you start, but you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere, exactly. And that's, that's the key. You could spin your wheels forever, you know, but if you start on some particular path, it's going to lead you somewhere, and you can't know where it is. You know, actually, you know, not into the field of engineering, but my youngest daughter, who I was just talking about, was floating around the pool yesterday. Um, got out of high school, kid with ADHD, uh, did not, always had a hard time studying, hard time knowing what to do. Came here to GCC and for three years just felt her way around. And she finally settled on the fact she was interested in, in nursing. Hmm. So this past, well, a year ago she got her associate's degree here. And then this past year she's been doing prerequisites for the nursing program. Uh, had a straight 4-0, made the dean's list, so, you know, the whole time. Yes, yeah. And she's just, in the fall, she's starting at Elms College. Oh. It's taken her a number of years to get there, and a long time working around her particular learning disabilities, but she found her way to get there. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think that would have been possible in any environment other than a community college such as GCC. Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't think it would have been possible for her. Mm -hmm. Because if she had just gone into a four-year college, she probably would have failed and failed miserably and given up. Yeah. 
And you know, the beauty of, of, that I see in a, a school like this is that you have so many places that you can, you can try. And you know, in order to find what you want to do, you have to find out what you're interested in. And you don't just know what you're interested in. Yeah. There are very rare instances that does exist. Somebody knows exactly what, to, what they want to be. And, uh, very seldom. Very seldom. I know a young woman who declared when she was like in the third grade she wanted to be an oceanographer. And she is now an oceanographer. But, you know, that's the only one I've ever run across. I mean, maybe that's just by, by virtue of the fact I only have a small, relatively small circle of friends and, and family. But uh, I don't think it's that often that it happens mm. that way. Mm. Most people have to cast around and figure out what they want. And like the individual you're talking about with m microscopy. Uh, he didn't know what he wanted to do until he started to or investigate. He thought he wanted to be chemical engineering. Then yeah. He thought he wanted to be into nano stuff, yeah. you know, stuff you yeah. couldn't even see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, so you don't know until you start to, start to investigate it. And uh, there are so many places you can go with things. Uh, and the difference, I think a huge difference today for students is that there is so much more uh, available in terms of guidance terms of how to make choices mm -hmm. and what the possibilities are. I mean, when, when I went to undergraduate school, the, the, the choices in engineering weren't, you, you couldn't create a degree for yourself. There wasn't a particular way you could design a degree for yourself that was peculiar to your interests. Yeah. You know, you're going to be mechanical, civil, right. electrical, chemical, or a chemist. That's what we had. And then they added biomedical engineering. But I mean, there, was, there were none of the other options in there in terms of, you know, combining fields and, and doing things, uh, which a lot of schools offer now. Mm. You, can, you can creatively design a degree for yourself. Right. right. And as long as you have enough uh, advisory supervision, they're happy to let you pursue it. I've been interested in the physical world ever since I was a kid, and there's not much that I'm not interested in. Mm -hmm. No, I'm constantly amazed that now, it, uh, I don't know if you've seen any of it, but the, from, from the International Space Station now they use uh, ground mapping, and they've been able to come up with a huge number of new archaeological sites to be investigated. Uh, oh, yeah, yes. So, <laughs> they, you know, from, from in space you can look at the Earth and say, you know, there's an anomaly on the ground that doesn't make sense. Right. And, you know, that, that, might, that might be the lost Atlantis, you <laughs> yeah, know. right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I subscribe to Archaeology Magazine because it, it, they are constantly finding new, new sites to investigate. Yeah. You know, like the Mayan population, the Mayan civilization. Out of all of the, the things they know about it, uh, there's probably only something like 18, 20 percent of the sites have ever been found. The rest of them are still buried in the jungle. Yeah, or under uh, the sand in the desert. Or under the sand in the <laughs> desert. So <laughs> you know, there are there are so many things. I mean, look at the new dinosaurs that they're 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 finding. You know, yeah, so they're finding new dinosaurs. That they just found a new sauropod that was huge. So I, you know. I've been interested in all that stuff, mineralogy, or, or archaeology. Or a shrew with the DNA of an elephant or something that was yeah. yesterday's news. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they still find occasionally the, 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 the well-preserved specimen of a uh, mastodon or something in the ice. Yeah. And yeah. Who knows, someday there'll be mastodons roaming the planet again. If they, someday they'll have the technology to, to clone things like that from uh, what Oh, yeah, ends. absolutely. So, um, as you stand back and, and look at, at the field of chemistry and chemistry applied to engineering, what do you think were the major breakthroughs and the major discoveries in that field over the years, in the time that you've been oh, I think studying it and working with it? Uh, there's a lot of synthetic materials that have come along, but I think the, the, the biggest part is being able to process materials uh, more effectively, more completely, uh -huh. less waste. Uh, a great deal less pollution. Uh, I think those are the biggest things. When the EPA, when the Clean Air Standards first came out in the 60s, and the EPA did its first environmental evaluation, they did it in uh, South Texas in the Houston area, and they came up with the fact that the industry had lost, in the year prior to their, their starting, almost a trillion pounds of chemicals. Jeez. And, and they based that on looking at manifests for raw materials that went into chemical plants and manifests for products that were shipped from the plants. And the difference was almost a trillion pounds of material. Chemicals were cheap, waste was not an issue, 
Uh, you could lagoon it, you could dump it on the ground, you put it in the ship channel, whatever you wanted to do with it, you could get rid of it. It ends up in people. It ends up in people. Um, that's why South Texas and down through that part of Louisiana in the Gulf is uh, basically Cancer Alley. Yeah. Uh, and the, a lot of business decisions down there are based on, well, I could do this and reduce the number of cancer deaths by this much. And when it got down to the point where I think the, the number was something like, if they could get down to where it was, the point at which they reached where they projected it would be 100 cancer deaths for every 150,000 people, it, they de determined it was too expensive to put that amount of improvement into the process. To, to reduce it less than 100 deaths per 150,000 from, from cancer. They felt like it was just uneconomical to deal with that. The cost-benefit trade-offs. The cost-benefit trade-offs, which, which industry and our society makes constantly in terms of human lives and, and profit going into the, the coffers of companies. Well, even like cars. Even like cars. You know, 30,000 people a year dead from automobile accidents, and yep. um, we still drive cars. Yep. You know, many, many years ago, my father, who was, like I said, a, a high school educated, trade school educated tinsmith, said, you know, there's absolutely no reason a car has to fail in three or four years. They build airplane engines that go a million miles. Yeah. They can build a car to go a million miles. Wow. It's just not economically viable in terms of keeping Ford Motor or General Motors or anybody else operating. No, somebody in Maine had a 1980 Honda Accord with a million miles on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If they you, gave him a new one. Oh, just, yeah, there was, there was, a, there was an old, old time car, an old Bentley or something in England that had been handed down for like three generations that was still running and still doing just fine. And it had many, many miles on it. So, does it bother you that um, a lot of these new chemicals that we manufacture um, have to get into the into the environment and that evolution has no defenses against a lot of these things. I was really surprised. Some years ago I went to work for North Philmont Herman, the private, private school, and when I get into the, uh, the chemistry prep room, uh, I discovered we had almost 200 pounds of liquid mercury. And that was not an uncommon amount for high schools Period. I can remember as a kid putting it on coins to make them all nice and shiny. shiny. <laughs> Play with it in the palm of your hand and <laughs> yeah, rubbing it until right. it all went away. Yeah, it is. The reason they had so much was f for the physics department. Yeah. Because the physics department could demonstrate floating a four-pound hammer on a, on, bed a, of on a bed of liquid, liquid mercury. mercury. <laughs> so it was there. And I, I was amazed at how much of that stuff there was to get rid of. Yeah. To handle, you know. So a lot of it is just not being aware of the consequences. A lot of it was not having the technology available to determine the consequences of it. Yeah. Uh, there's always that rush to profit. And, uh, you know, there's lots of things. That, and it's part of that, you know, it has to, the chemistry, chemicals have to be tested, but I really do not believe in using animals for, for no, testing. Oh, my God. If physiology is different, and I don't want to torture anything just to see whether it's going to, yeah. if this stuff is going to kill me, there are, there are other ways to deal with it. Right. And uh, I think we're reaching a point where, in terms of knowledge, we can look at the chemical structure of a compound and say, and pretty well. by virtue of this structure, it is hazardous to people. Right. And it's not going to break down in the environment. It's hazardous to the environment. Yeah. And we need to be careful about how we control yeah. it. A great example of that type of material was the uh, incident with the, in Bhopal, India, back in the early 80s with uh, methyl isocyanate. And uh, I think it was Union Carbide yeah. that had the plant over there it making was. methyl isocyanate. Methyl isocyanate is, a, is an intermediate chemical that is used in uh, lots of other things. But, you know, it's an intermediate that's used to make a lot of other finished products. Like what? Uh, plastics, you know, fertilizers, yeah, or yeah, what? Yeah, probably f more often plastics than plastics. anything else. Yeah. Uh, and it's a heavier than air material. It escapes from the plant, the local villages nearby. At uh, a low level live on, uh, sleep on f either mats on the floor or, yeah. or low beds. The stuff flowed into the, into the villages and killed a lot of people. And like 100,000 was some fantastic yeah. Oh, some, um, but they're, s they're still litigating this, you know, 30 or 40 years later. Uh, well, 30 plus years later, they're still mm -hmm. litigating it. And the benefit to that was that methyl isocyanate was carried by the truckload through many, many cities in this country because it's made in huge quantities in, uh, in Ohio. Mm. 
and uh, it's transported up to General Electric in the northeast up here for making their uh, silanes, which go into the silicones. Silicon yep. caulking compounds. Yep. And yeah, and uh, a lot of other things. And what it did was it, 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 it was a real uh, eye-opener for the chemical industry. So now what's done in many, many cases, and not only with methyl isocyanate, but a lot of other chemicals, is that if, say, DuPont wants to build a plant to make some dangerous material like this, they will coordinate it with their customers in terms of, you know, who uses most of this material. And they try to marry the situation so that the biggest users Close are to the big to the plant, right there. Very close to the yeah. supplier. Yeah. And they can pipe it underground or yeah. whatever from one plant to the other, and it has doesn't have to come out into the environment. Yeah. If they're handling materials that have, like that, that have a potential for a release with a human mistake or equipment failure, yeah. uh, they started creating these very large green zones around chemical plants. Mm -hmm. In the case of some of the plants in uh, Texas in particular, they had to buy up land. They bought up land like a mile around the plant. And they bought all the houses and everything just and tore them all down. Just to be safe. Just to have a buffer. And yeah. a lot of the things they make down there are things like phosgene, which goes into uh, uh, things like mustard gas, but it's also another chemical precursor for a lot of things. And it's PCL3, you know, phosphorus trichloride. Mm -hmm. And it's really nasty. It's the kind of thing where phosgene, if you ingest 40 parts per million, it's going to kill you. And it's sometime in the next 24 hours, you'll fall down, you know. It's not fast. It's fast enough, but, you know. Jeez. It's, it's nasty material. And, you know, so they created these green buffer zones around it. All of those things were a function of Union Carbide having Happen a in big screw up in, in Bhopal. In yep. Yeah. Jeez. Well, you know, in, in uh, the science, Murphy's Law of Unintended Consequences, I mean, it seems like to be in the sciences these days and responsible for this stuff, you need to know about the environment and what what is okay and what's not okay. I think a, a large piece of this too is the fact of just simply the knowledge of, of what you've got. If you think back to the very early chemistry experiments when, when the, the people who were researching weren't even sure what they were working with, had no idea what they were going to produce, and having produced it they didn't know what they had, and or the, the consequences of making it, you know. And uh, there are a lot of instances, I'm sure, where these scientists and wannabe scientists died in the process of yeah. uh, doing their basic Madame research. Madame Curie, right? Yeah, well, Madame Curie and her husband, too. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she's still yeah. amazing for having two Nobel Prizes, and one in physics and one in chemistry. Right, right. There aren't many people that have that, let alone a woman. Yep. And I say let alone a woman, but, you know, in yeah. the day of when the, they didn't give awards for, for things, you know, she, she as a woman got two of them. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of unintended consequences to uh, a, a lot of this, and uh, the perceptions we have of the the people who do it. Yeah. So what would you see uh, looking ahead now, rather than looking back? What do you see are going to be the major areas for employment for chemical engineers? Well, it's going to be a, a, a lot with still making materials. I mean, we, they're still going to be there's materials. Always going to be making materials. Um, the chemical industry is probably one of the one of, if not the largest industries in the in the country. In fact, in the world, because they make something like the chemistry chemical industry in this country makes something like eighty thousand products, which are primarily precursors that go into other businesses to yeah. make things like toothpaste and shampoo right. and clothing and paint and everything else. So yeah. I mean, there's, you're never going to get away from it. You know, it's always going to be there. Uh, new types of paint, new paint, uh, you know, they start to think about the possibilities of things, you know, all these new paints that are conductive and, and reflective and all sorts of things. Uh, it, it's going to constantly grow in terms of uh, quantities of materials. It's going to be how to make large quantities of materials, increase the, the capacity, reduce the amount of waste, maintain environmental controls, and at the same time, increase profit. Yeah. Not, not easily done, but, and then there's all the new materials that are coming, you know? Constantly so new pharmaceuticals and things. What do, you, what do you see as far as our energy sources go? I mean, we've been treating the, the atmosphere as an open sewer with chimneys and with, yeah. you know, and now all of that's catching up with us um, with respect to carbon dioxide, increasing the temperature of the planet increasing the CO2 level by 40 percent because of burning fossil fuels? We're going to have to accept, I think, if we're going to burn fossil fuels f for energy, 
we're going to have to come up with a, a CO2 capture system, pay the price of doing it, and then we're going to have to allow sequestration of it somewhere. Yeah, underground, back or underground. Back underground. Right. And there are, you know, huge salt deposits in the in the Gulf area and places like that where it's very uh, uh, geophysically stable yeah. that you could put this material. Yeah. And it should be sequestered somewhere. It should be. Uh, it's going to make energy more expensive. Yeah, but, but again, for something that has the potential for destroying life on the planet, it should be expensive. Yeah, right. <laughs> it should yeah. be expensive. Yeah. And we we should not expect to get it. Uh, have our cake and eat it too type of thing in terms of the the, the consequences of it. Well, with with solar and wind, uh, solar works good in the southwest, and wind works good in Texas and up through the middle of the country where the yep. wind speeds are high enough for to make wind farms economical. But uh, New England, what do we got? We got biomass and nuclear, yep. and those are our two choices. I am not against nuclear power, and. The th the, for me, the, the, the basis for that is that we can, we can make it safe if we choose to deal properly with the waste mm. and recognize that it has to be contained and it has to be sequestered somewhere. Yeah. And somebody has to, you know, the, the NIMBY thing, not in my backyard, has to, has to give way at some point to the yeah. fact that we need to make, it, make this safe for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but hand in hand with that, it's what runs the universe. Yeah. We live on the sun. Fusion, we live on the nuclear fusion yeah. in the sun. Yeah. <laughs> well, that the core of our planet is a nuclear reactor. It is, and we w we wouldn't be alive without it. Exactly, because the Earth would have cooled off by now. Yep, and it would be a dead planet. Anyway, so one final question, um, and this is probably the hardest one. Uh, in your mind, what would you feel a scientifically literate person should know? As, as kind of the basis that everyone should know about chemistry. About chemistry in particular? Yeah. I think people should understand chemistry to the extent that they know what's going on around them. And when I say that, th they should be sufficiently chemistry literate to look at something and say, okay, uh, you know, that paint, that plastic, you know, the photosynthesis going on in that tree, the concrete that I'm walking on, the asphalt that's being laid down on the ground, the fuel that I'm burning, um, the Windex that I'm washing the windows of my car with, like the, paper, in it? the paper towels <laughs> that I'm handling. You know, not only knowing what's in it, but just recognizing that this is produced through chemistry. You know? Yeah. And you know, it's there. Everything that I do involves chemistry. And I cannot imagine going through life not having enough chemistry literacy to recognize that I need to put a lock on my kitchen cabinet when there's a toddler around. Because the chemistry that's in there in terms of wash cleaning my sink or cleaning the drain, whatever, has the very, very real potential of killing that little person. Yeah. And... Uh, knowing that I can't put rat poison out where my animals might get it, or, you know, all these things. I mean, I, it, it, there's lots of degrees of chemical literacy, but, I mean, it's got to be somewhere where uh, you, cannot, you cannot go through life today, in my opinion, being ignorant of chemistry. You have to have some, some grasp of chemistry. And uh, in, in terms of chemistry education, I've gone around and around with uh, people in, in some high school courses where they want to do what's called ChemCom, chemistry in the community, mm. which deals only with, you know, the, the rubbing alcohol and putting on my, on the swab and, you know, things like that, and recognizing that I can't drink isopropyl alcohol, I can drink ethanol, you know, that's the only one I can drink, and, uh, you know, what's in cleaners and things, just having some basic household chemistry, but, you know, as a bare minimum, people need that. But I, I, I think it needs to be significantly more than that. I think people have to understand that, you know, all of these uh, things that we have are, are made up of atoms, and the atoms are made up of elements, and the elements are, a lot of them are relatively scarce. And, you know, we have to appreciate the fact that all of this is coming from our environment and from the world around us, and we need to be able to handle all of that respectfully. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can handle day-to-day -day activity with, with real respect, unless you have some grasp of chemistry. I think as a science department here at 
um, Greenfield Community College, that's a responsibility that we have. Maybe we're going to end up with a science regents exam, the equivalent thereof. Maybe. Um, I would like to see the same thing extended to physics. I mean, yeah. one of the, I used to teach physics on the side, you know, a little bit of here and there. And uh, one of the things that I used to do as a demonstration was called a monkey shoot. You have a spring-loaded oh. ball <laughs> yeah. and a monkey hanging from an electromagnet yeah. or a teddy bear, whatever. Yeah. And when you let the ball go, it breaks the circuit, the monkey falls, yeah. and somehow or other, the ball always finds the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Why does that happen? <laughs> and, you know, I would ask parents that, and they would have no idea that you could actually do that, you know. Gravity works no matter what. You yeah, know? it sure does. And, I mean, things like that, I think, are things that people, yeah. people need to understand. Anything else you'd like to add to this all, Bill? I really appreciate you taking your time to... No, I, can't, I can't think, you know, I can, I can talk about these sorts of things for, for forever, basically. Uh, you know, my, my thing is that uh, I have just been always interested in, in the environment and everything around me. So yeah. the chemistry is just a, a great place for me to, to, do to, to work on that. And, uh, you know, it's, been, it's just been, it's been, been a, a good career, right? It's been a very rewarding career, yeah. very rewarding career. Teaching was not something I really wanted to do. And that was really a function of uh, being somewhat of an introvert and uh, sort of an anxious individual and yeah. just could not see myself comfortable in front of uh, a students. Class, in right. In front of class. And it's still, it's still anxious. Every time I walk into a classroom for the first class, there's still some anxiety involved in it. But I have to say, after having done it now for the better part of 20 years, uh, it really is rewarding to see students come back and, and, and say thank you right. and find them pursuing a career that I never thought they'd be pursuing. And in several instances, that's been a career in chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. So uh, the rewards are there. And uh, I've loved finding them in the end. And uh, I love working with my students. And uh, you know, chemistry is still a part of that. Yeah. I think once you have a basis in the sciences and in engineering, there's a lot of directions you can go. Oh, there's a huge number of. Uh, that, that's, that's your key to freedom on yeah. some level, of occupational and, freedom. And, <laughs> and again, what you, what you, the question about the, you know, like chemistry literacy, I think once you begin to develop a literacy in any of the sciences, you get to see things and experience thoughts about what my future could be that you'll never get any other way. Right. You need that basic literacy to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to end. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. All right. <laughs>